Monty Merrick here, director of Humboldt Wildlife Care Center and Bird Ally X. I just have a couple of concepts I was going to talk about today. Things that, you know, you can always consider if you're a wildlife rehabilitator and you are up against, you know, any situation. These three items are things that will always benefit your patient if you give them a proper consideration. So very quickly, they are warmth, hydration, and stress. You can think about those three things. There is no point in their care that thinking about those would not benefit. doesn't mean that the patient needs warmth, but if you're always considering those things, you will be a real strong leg up on staying on top of how that patient is doing and how their care is proceeding. So first of all, stress. There is no point in the rehab process where you are not stressing out your patient. Your patient is always going to be stressed. Stress is made worse by um, hypothermia. It is made worse by dehydration. It is made worse by just about everything. So taking care of some basic stabilization and general you know, parameters, such as body temperature and properly hydrated, will go a long way toward helping your patient deal with the unavoidable stress of captivity. So stress, um, stress is a killer and it also interferes with healing, it interferes with recovery, it interferes with um, being able to eat without uh, fear, you know. Um, Reducing the stress of your patient is super important and simple ways of doing that are by reducing your presence around the patient. So you keep the sounds to a minimum, you keep your visual barriers in place, cover patient's head when they're being handled inside of their housing once they are alone and you're not bothering them. Uh, being housed with conspecifics or even cousins can be very beneficial. Why not? You know, you have a striped skunk, you have a spotted skunk, you can house them together. Being together will benefit them. That's always something that we can do at any point in our patient's care. We can look and say, is there a way that we can reduce the stress that this patient is going through? And anything that you can do to reduce that stress is a boon to your patient. And of course, the last thing that you can do to reduce the ultimate stress, the ultimate stress that you can reduce is the stress of captivity. And you can do that by releasing patients when they're ready to go. And you can also do that by making sure that you're not hanging on to patients that are never gonna be releasable. So that's one thing to really think about. So let's go back to warmth. Any patient that comes in, it's a safe bet that they are going to be exhibiting symptoms that um, a little bit of heat support is gonna go a long way. At our clinic, we have two incubators set up. One is at 75 degrees and one is at 95 degrees because maybe 75 is enough. You know, sometimes, you know, cause not everybody requires warmth. And so we do have that available, something that is more just like a room temperature or slightly warm, 75 degrees Fahrenheit or the 95 degree Fahrenheit for guys that are in maybe more critical condition or babies who are not able to thermoregulate themselves. So adults who are injured are gonna be exhibiting symptoms of shock. Most likely, this is not a universal. There's occasionally a surf scoter comes in who's got a raging temperature and we just don't, you know, and, that, and that's outside of the ordinary. But what's ordinary is a low temp. Um, if a patient comes in and they have a critically low temperature, like let's say if we're talking about a bird whose ordinary temperature should be somewhere between 39 and 42 Celsius and they come in and their temperature is 37 degrees Celsius, that is a patient that maybe you're going to wanna to work on their warmth before you do anything else, before you find out anything else that's going on with them when you're doing their first exam, you will want to um, address that first because the stress of being handled when they, when they are hypothermic is exacerbated because they don't have the resources available to um, deal with you, the stress that you're putting them through just by being a conscientious caregiver. And another thing is, is that hypothermia is often is a symptom of dehydration. Be getting a, a dehydrated patient stable temperature wise is very difficult. Part of the process of stabilizing a hypothermic patient is bringing their hydration back into within normal limits. So there's a couple of things about that that you really wanna think about. One is sub-Q fluids. 
Sub-Q fluids are a way that we get fluids into the patient, and we do that by putting it subcutaneously, hence sub-Q. It's not really a Q, it's really a C. Um, if you're didactic like that, we can discuss it later in the comments section, or we can meet it and have, you know, over a beer or something like that. But um, for the most part, we'll just stick with sub-Q means subcutaneous. And that is a way of administering fluids. It's a way of administering a lot of different meds and things like that. But administering fluids subcutaneously is a good way to hydrate a patient unless your patient is hypothermic. And then it's not a good way because even if you warm those fluids and you put them subdermally, that's going to turn into a heat sink. The warm fluids will cool off and then instead of hydrating and warming your patient, they will in fact um, make your patient colder. So you have to be very careful with that. So if your patient is too cold to give sub-Q fluids to, you still have other routes. If they're able to hold their head up, you can give them oral fluids where you're going to put it right in their belly. And a bolus of warm fluids in the belly, I mean, if you've ever been cold and a chill that you can't get, can't shake, you know, a mug of hot tea does work, right? Same deal. So warm fluids on a hypothermic patient who is able to hold their head up and they're alert, they're not in danger of regurgitating and possibly aspirating those fluids, that's a great way to do it. Um, if you're capable and you can hit a vein, IVs with warm fluids is another great way to hydrate a patient who is hypothermic. Otherwise, you're going to have to work on getting them warm at the same time that you're uh, trying to deal with it. And you can, if critically low patients, you can submerge them in warm water, you know, keeping their head out, don't drown them. But, you know, there's, uh, you can, if you're strapped for, you know, your incubator's not warm enough, you can always like take hot water into a, uh, say, one of your gloves, your, your, um, you know, procedural gloves, your exam gloves. You can fill those with, make little hot water balloons and nestle them around the patient. There's lots of ways to bring your patient's temperature up. And once your patient's temperature is up, then it is perhaps safer at that time to give them subcutaneous fluids. So if they're not able to hold their head up and they're critically dehydrated and they're hypothermic, perhaps IV is the only method you have, or you may be forced to just try to warm them up without using fluids if you're not able to give an IV and they are not able to be tubed through orally because they are in danger of being, you know, they're just not with it enough, not alert enough, and you also can't give sub-Q fluids. But as soon as they're um, warm or you're putting them into an environment that's very warm, then sub-Q fluids become a lot safer. But in any case, the point is, is that it's possible to mess this up. And so you have to monitor what you're doing closely. A patient who is both dehydrated critically and hypothermic does deserve your close attention until they're stable. At every point from then on, once they're stable, you can put a bird, say an aquatic bird, say a common murn, you put him out in a pool. He's stable. He's maintaining a temperature, he's eating, he's doing everything. But once he's out in the pool, something happens and that bird stops eating, that bird's going to become dehydrated. You have to monitor for hydration all of the time. And if you have a patient who's losing weight, there's a strong possibility they're dehydrated. If you have a patient who's suffering from a parasite load, strong possibility they're dehydrated. If you have a patient who's on anti-inflammatories, it's probably a good idea to supplement um, the uh, anti-inflammatory with hydration because anti-inflammatories can be dehydrating. At every point in the care of the patient though, you want always patients with diarrhea, probably dehydrated. There's almost nothing that's going on with your patient other than recovery that does, should not trigger you to wonder if the patient is dehydrated and then treat if possible. Lots of, cyst lots of ways to tell if the patient is dehydrated. Skin tenting, you know, elasticity in the skin. You can use eyelids um, on birds. You can use capillary refill time. Like, so you take your, like, see that? Or it's like, oh, look how quickly that, well, kind of slow. I am feeling kind of thirsty. Um, so anyway, stress, big one. Hydration and warmth are important to all living beings. When an animal is free, they own themselves. Their agency is theirs. If they want to go over there, they can. If they want to do this, they can. And um, 
when we have them in captivity, we are taking that away from them. And you can put yourself in those shoes and think about how you would feel if your personal agency was denied. And so those are the big three topics. Shall I write them down? I think I will. They are hypothermia. We'll put that warmth. They are dehydration. Fluids, stress, manners, and freedom. Okay. If you have any questions or you want to talk about this, this is a very, this is just skeletal really at this point, but every one of these things, every one of these three items is something that we could talk about for an hour or more, um, stress especially. So uh, this is just to keep that in your mind, warmth, hydration, and stress. You keep those three things under control and a lot of your other problems will take care of themselves. All right, till next time, see you later. Thanks a lot and uh, thank you for your love of the wild.